Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. I've got the, uh, my slides up. So um, we looked, uh, saw a little sneak into the uh, infinite possibilities, which is, is a nice term, um, whether that's Viv or um, the next big trend, which, um, which is looking quite interesting in terms of virtual reality um, and people kind of losing all time space. Uh, in that space, so people are thinking in they're in virtual reality for seven minutes, and they've actually been in there for thirty, which has a you know is a little bit scary being a parent. Now uh, I've got the classic uh, piss take up on the uh, on the on the slide there in terms of um, campaign. So I wanted to take a di little different spin because my frustration uh, from being your side of the table is how do we organise for this? Um, and I'm going to take a little moment if I can. And I'm going to break uh, conference protocol. I'm going to talk about my kids. I'm uh, sorry for that. I've got no photos or anything. Don't worry, it's not going to be a big slideshow. But um, I was thinking about it when I was writing this presentation. And one of the things I see most mornings is my daughter. She's quite petite. Um, you know, she's 13 years old. Uh, and she kind of summarizes where we're at at the moment for me. I see her every morning, and she kind of hunched over a little bit. And she's walking along to, the, to go and catch the school bus. She, um, she's carrying bags and lots of gear. So she's carrying, and so she looks a little bit like a pack animal. She's got all the books, she's got the writing pads, the pens, the paper, but then, oh, let's just pop in a computer, a laptop as well, and the phone and, and so on. So she's got all this weight, and then you pop a few um, sports bags, fortunately, are still doing a bit of sport. Um, so it's not like we've got the old school and the new school, you know, uh, 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 or, and we've moved to a new school. It's like we've got everything. We've got both. So it's, we're in this place at the moment where, where and, you know, for, in communications, we're feeling like the pack animals. Yeah? It, we're, um, so we have traditional communications. They, uh, it felt like quite a controlled environment. You know, we had our press releases. We, um, you know, pu punched things out to the media. Things were pretty much in the same shape or form. You know, you could put, you know, sometimes the newspapers frustrate us a bit and they changed a little, um, but it was pretty much pretty similar. Um, you know, we, uh, there might be the odd emergency where you get questions from the minister where you've got to react quite quickly um, and, and questions from the press. But it was quite, a, it's quite controlled and we have this mass media. We also have um, traditional um, structures and plans. So, uh, you know, uh, great conversations and tensions between marketing and comms. And then you've got um, digital, maybe, as a, de as a separate department. And then you've got um, IT is now a massive part of our world and helping us with, our, um, with communications. And then you're trying to bring in the product and service controllers, uh, you know, people in your organization who are actually at the coalface and trying to deal with people. Um, and then we have plans. We have these visions and missions and strategies and, and so on. Um, so we, we're quite structured, we're really structured, and it's all set around this, the, you know, where we've been. And it's a kind of, the futurists would talk about this sort of scarcity model. Um, you know, we've been, we've been, our systems are all set up for scarcity. Now in the, in new comms, and my new comms kind of has just slipped off the page there, um, the control button feels like it's been kind of ripped out. And some of those conversations between marketing, digital, and, and comms show that kind of, kind of stress. But um, you know, the, in the new world, it's much more editorial. It's much more now. It's it's two-way conversation. It's suddenly this whole new group of influencers have come up. Um, so it's not, you know you've got journalists, but then you've got more influencers that are online that you might want to uh, get in touch with. It feels very fast-paced. And what we've done is we've we've kind of done. We're trying to do it all all together. We just kept kept everything, all the old stuff that we used to do, and we kept the new. And this is, I love this chart from, and it kind of summarizes where, what Nick was talking about in terms of these guys, you know, these supercomputers that we have in our hands every day. Consumers, now their experience is driven by Uber, by Viv. You know, like Uber, I can see the cars flo floating around that I can then pick up and I can see it come to me. I can get a text message that tells me that it's two minutes away and that it's here and where it is. And, and we um, review each other. They tell whether I'm a good customer and so on. Everybody sees it. And the money's done. It's, it's sorted. So 
consumers are, all, are right at the forefront and all these n the new technologies are driving their expectations and we, the organisations, be that business or government, are now being, um, we're stacked against those organisations. So they're expecting you to have an experience as good as Facebook, as good as Uber, as good as Airbnb. And that's quite a challenge. Um, oh, a little bit scrambled there. I digitized it. Um, and this is quite a nice chart in terms of this is MIT and Capgemini talking about um, this is pretty much universal across all organizations and it, it relates to profit, but it does work across our government as well. If you go and chase digital, um, you know, they call them fashionistas. Um, but if you go and be that uh, pack animal chasing, uh, you know, doing all the old stuff and all the new, you might, you know, if you do nothing, you're going you're gonna to slip back 24%. If you go and chase the digital stuff and add that on, you're going to be working uh, like a pack animal and you're probably going to be slipping back 11%. Where the real benefit comes in is in organizing for change. So actually changing those structures changing the, um, the organization and then fo and, and following the new um, digital uh, channels as part of the new mix. And then you get the whammy, you know, you, you end up in positive. So organizational change is a massive part of what we need to do. It's not just about adding more stuff and, and being this pack animal. And what I think we can do is we can start, there is only one place really to start with, and, and we can learn something from the Silicon Valley and the, and the new apps and, and so on. What we tend to do, and I'm sure you've all been in it, is we tend to, I've been in multiple restructures. That's the kind of first thing we do. We get a kind of strategy, a new strategy, and then we restructure. And then 18 months later, we get another different strategy because that one didn't work, and we, um, and we restructure again. But basically, we're being that pack animal, we're being a bit of a donkey, and we're not thinking about, we're not redesigning the world. And so the new app guys, the benefits of Uber, Airbnbs, and, and so on, and there's a great case, if you look at Airbnb and um, Fast Company, you can see how they use this kind of, um, what I'm gonna talk about in terms of customer experience, really, re to solve their problems. But the new guys, this is how they're working. Get the surface right. And by that, they mean the customer experience, the journey, get the touch points right, and then work on the back and figure out the underlying systems and technology. We are constantly doing the other way around. So like an app, you work on the surface, the customer experience, how you engage people, what are the customer touch points, and you map it. And so this is the, that bit where, at the moment in a traditional plan, your program of work is kind of the last thing that comes out in a plan. You've got your vision and your mission and your strategy, and suddenly, uh, eventually, a program of work comes out. This is actually flipping that and saying, actually, let's map the touch points for the consumer from beginning to end. Now, you can do this as a totality of a process, and I'll show you, or you can do it as a, as a snippet, and you can, you can take off bite-sized pieces, because it does take time to get get good at it and uh, it takes time to perfect it. But if you map those um, processes out, you can start adding some richness, richness into it. So you can start saying how people feel during those moments. This is um, people uh, you know, going for a, um, a journey and, um, and their luggage and, and so on, following them through. It's a, cla you know, a classic where the airlines look at the key points in there to, and, and try and improve the environment. But if you look at those moments, and then you can go back. So you look at the surface, how we interact with people, where are those interactions, and then design the channels and the communication around it. Here's one I, I did for um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it kind of um, is a great opportunity. The reason we've, it's almost like a heat map for those who use, do it a little bit of digital and um, have used heat mapping software and, and it shows the pain points, and here I've highlighted one, two, three, four pain points um, for the organization. You can kind of roughly see a green line of, of post-it notes running through the middle. That's, that's the kind of main process. And then what I've done is I've got the organization to kind of come in. So I've got, um, I've managed to 
break down silos using this. So, you know, come in, tell me about how we do this. So this is internal process and external touch points. And you can see, um, you know, there's a lot of heat up front because we it was quite unplanned and lots of people doing exactly the same jobs, the same things. Um, you can see number four there, we can see a bit of the process completely outside the main process that's going on and, um, and somebody's putting that in. And what you also get as a byproduct of that is little nuggets where there's amazing bits of value that your organization offers that you haven't actually realized before, haven't seen because you've never looked at this connected journey um, uh, and, and really planned it out. So this is just to frame it so it, cause it can feel a bit overwhelming. This is just a journey for our events program. So we're, this is working for Export uh, NZTE, and we were looking at our events program. And traditionally, we looked at it on an individual basis. So we're going to a customer each time and going, uh, oh, hey, uh, this, this event might be two, two, to, two days to four months away. And we were knocking on their door and going, are you interested? And we thought, oh, well, maybe there's a better way of being a, bit, a little bit more planned. And so we, we produced that. And then we started evolving our future map. And you can start to clear out some of that clutter because, because we've been in uh, donkey world and in that pack animal uh, mentality, we've, been, uh, we've, been, we've all been covering for each other. We're all, there's massive amounts of duplication. And suddenly, you, it's as, you know, and now we're in this kind of more abundant space, we need to be choosing what we do what we don't do and where those bits of magic are. And just by mapping that out, you can really see how, how you should proceed. And then you can put the organization and put your team around it. You can start to really put some detail around it. So I'm going to leave you, I think, I'm pretty good on time, um, hopefully. And, but my, um, my challenge to you is to think about the surface. Think about consumer touch points. Don't think about channels. Don't think about um, you know, all the of structures and reorganization. Think about what you want to achieve with customers at what point. What, or in your, in your terms, what, you know, think about the general public. What do they need at the point? Map it out and physically put those point, touch points on. Um, and the, the greatest thing is if you can visualize this. And if you look at that Airbnb example, they actually got Pixar uh, cartoonists to come in and draw it, make it visual, get it up on the wall so that people can um, get into it, and you'll start involving the rest of the organisation. And you know, comms can be quite step outside the organisation, bring it in and make it an integrated part of the um, part of the organisation. And if you get the surface right, then everything else makes sense. Whilst we're trying to, we don't know what this world looks like then you, we feel like pack animals, you know, pack horses, and we're, we're really struggling. But thanks very much. Kia ora tato, na mihi mahana. Morena, good morning. Um, I'm the dinosaur. I'm going to be talking about old media. Old media. But after listening to Chris Galloway this morning, I thought I might just change the title of this uh, presentation to The Ender's Thigh. <laughs> and taking, taking Nick's uh, instruction on board, I'm going to see if Viv will do that for us, Nick. Viv. <laughs> Viv, change, change the title of this presentation to The End is Thigh. I rest my case. <laughs> so I've got to be a disruptive influence in this presentation. We've agreed that ahead of time. Uh, but it does feel a little bit ironic to be standing here talking about traditional media uh, in a media environment that is changing so rapidly uh, that I doubt there is actually any traditional media organization that still exists. Um, Digital disruption is having a huge impact on traditional media outlets, uh, but they are evolving and they continue to evolve at a pace that I suggest looking at today's media environment, it will be totally unrecognizable in six months' time. Like the dinosaurs, those that don't evolve will die. Um, so let's have a look at whether traditional 
um, media still has a, a place in modern emergency management. I'm going to give you a quick snapshot looking particularly at television, radio and newspapers in the New Zealand environment. Um, it will be very quick and very dirty uh, because we've agreed leaving time for question and answer at the end will be fantastic. And I think, Charlotte, I might have already answered one of your questions about what happens when modern technology dies. <coughs> Um, so let's um, just acknowledge, for me, acknowledge that um, I'm going to show you some information that's drawn from the latest Nielsen Media Trends um, survey. It's something that they do every year. They take a snapshot of New Zealand media environment. So in 2015, we had 3.5 million New Zealanders watching live television in any week. That's 84% of the New Zealand population, 5 plus. And we spend about three hours a day watching television. 2014 figure, the comparable figure was 3.6 million. Uh, that's 86% of the population. That's a significant drop of about 2.5% over a 12-month period. No judgments here about the quality of reality TV or whether The Bachelor should choose NAS or not or whatever. <laughs> but for television, and, and I suspect Nick will agree with this, um, declining and the trend continues. But if we are talking about emergency communication, 3.5 million people is still a significant chunk of the New Zealand population. Uh, if we look at my own medium, radio, 3.2 million listened to radio in the last week. That's 82% of the population. And again, that figure hasn't changed much in recent years. Uh, it's showing a slight decline over 2014. Um, but radio audiences in general are holding their own quite well. The thing is, we are anticipating a steady decline in that live listenership. Uh, as, as consumers look to multi-platform delivery and multi-platform content. 3.2 million, that's still not a bad number if you're thinking about getting your messages out there to a traditional media audience. I want to return to radio a little bit later in this presentation because I think it has an important message for us, as I would. Newspapers. 2.8 million uh, engaged in uh, reading a newspaper in a typical week. Now that could be a daily or a, a weekend newspaper or a Sunday paper, or, and I think this one's quite important, one of the free community newspapers uh, that we often get delivered to our door every week. These are hard copies, they're not online, so this is not talking about stuff or uh, the Herald website or any of the other media websites that there are around. In 2014, the figure was uh, a little lower than this, at about 79% of the New Zealand population. So again, arguing my case, um, traditional media is still significant and important. They are holding steady at the moment, but we would expect a steady decline, but still important for that public communication. The next slide, however, gives us an indication of the real crunch point for traditional media. In 2015, 3.4 million New Zealanders personally owned a mobile device. That's 86% of people 10 plus. In 2014, that was 3.17 million. That's a year-on-year -year growth of 6%. That's extraordinary, and that trend is continuing. The impact of the growth of mobile devices on traditional media has fundamentally changed the way that content is being delivered. Traditional media is still strong, but being really seriously buffeted by the winds of change from digital devices and digital platforms. This digital disruption has had a major impact on the old ways of doing business and the old media models. And we'll look at a couple, example, couple of examples in a moment of what's happening in New Zealand right now. But just looking at this, New Zealanders are more mobile and more connected than ever before. However, no one thing or one device or one platform is completely replacing any other. Rather, we're replacing media and we continue to add to our media repertoire. We all know 
multi-device homes. How many of you sit in a, in, a, in a lounge at night or in a kitchen and you've got the television on, you've got your iPad running, you've got a laptop running in the corner, the kids are in the corner on social media. These are multi-device homes. We are multitasking and we're on multiple platforms. So traditional media still remain an important element in what you are communicating to your public. To counter that impact of, of multi-device consumption, uh, traditional media outlets have had to change and evolve. If they didn't, they're dead already. Change, they, they've changed how they organise their business and how they work with you as a public. Digital disruption, significant impact on traditional media. Let's just summarise that. Traditional media in long-term decline, future of content delivery is multimedia, multi-platform, it's personalised, it's mobile and it's social. And traditional media are having to evolve. The edges are blurring. The old school radio, television and newspapers are merging into digital delivery on devices that are always switched on. As media consumers, we're now in a position where we call the shots. More control is in the hands of the end user than ever before. So the content has to be delivered when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. And that has significant implications for emergency communications. Communication is now a two-way process. That's Tim's point that he made earlier. We now expect to engage directly with our medium of choice. And we expect that medium of choice to engage directly with us. We are not only in control of, we, as, as participants, we are not only in control of the medium, we are in control of the supply of content to those media organisations. We've seen the growth of citizen journalism, direct public engagement, people are now providing videos, photos, commentary, opinion, they create their own perceptions of reality. And in an emergency, you won't be the only source of information, no matter how much you wish you were. The biggest danger for all of us is an information vacuum. We have to provide accurate, timely, trusted information, or the public will fill the gap with their own. And we can always imagine that worst case scenario where there is shared viral content that's developed a life of its own, it's out of the box, and you can't call it back. That's really scary in an in emergency situation. So let's really briefly look at how two media organisations are responding to disruption. Um, most of you, I'm sure, are aware of the proposed merger between NZME and Fairfax. That is going to be a major change in the New Zealand media environment. Many outlets are struggling to monetize their online content at the moment. These two are classic examples. Both Fairfax and NZME have been cutting staff and cutting costs for several years. But this merger represents the biggest change in New Zealand media for many decades. I think there are probably potential pros and cons in this as, as emergency communicators. You will have two dominant media outlets who will merge to form the biggest media group. Potentially under one umbrella, you will have Stuff, New Zealand Herald, Sunday Star Times, The Dominion Post, Waikato Times, The Press, News Talk ZB, multiple music radio stations and radio sport. It's not yet clear what will happen to the two big websites. So you've got the Herald on one side and you've got Stuff on the other. What is clear though is that Stuff is the dominant player. They could be merged into one. Potentially there could be a paywall. It could mean you have to pay to access information. I think for me, and I'd, I'd be keen to discuss this possibly as a Q&A, the biggest impact will be in the community newspapers area. And that's something that's an area where all of us at a local level will often have a very close relationship with local journalists and with the community newspaper. Most of those papers are owned by one or other of the big players. Fairfax is the dominant, um, the dominant uh, entity there. And my understanding is very clear that Fairfax owning 45% of the neighbourly website 
will be aiming long term to close community newspapers as the growth of neighbourly takes over. There are some significant things to think about as emergency communicators in that fact. So very quickly, oh, sorry, go back. Very quickly, not forgetting my own organisation, Radio New Zealand. I'll skip through this really quickly. Radio New Zealand, um, very strong on traditional radio, a traditional broadcaster. Uh, in the last 18 months, we've made the strategic decision that we will become far more digital and online focused. And some of you may be aware of a name change, a branding change, where we've moved to call ourselves RNZ rather than Radio New Zealand. That simply reflects the fact that there has been massive growth for our content online. And as many people now access on digital devices uh, and multiple platforms as they do through trad traditional live radio. Just a fact of life. So our major growth is, is online. Best example of this probably is the new Checkpoint program with John Campbell, which is online, on air, it's visible on uh, Freeview, and you can pick it up through YouTube. So just one example. Key point for Radio New Zealand, um, and I'm sure most of you here will be aware of it, we are the lifeline utility radio broadcaster in the event of an emergency. That brings with it obligations and responsibilities. And it leads me to my own little disruption. I'm going to put this slide up just for a few moments and let you think about it. In most situations, emergency communications are enhanced by digital media, digital devices, and the growth of networked or online options. There's not much that is less old school media than the yellow pages, right? You can't get any more old school than that. It's a significant communication channel for McDem, Anthony. Inside the front cover of the yellow pages is your get ready, get through sheet. And what does this tell us? Top survival item in the event of an emergency, battery powered radio. What are the items that you need to have in your emergency kit? Torch and radio with batteries. What do you do in an emergency? Listen to the radio. Very, very strong examples came out of Christchurch of people gathered around cars, listening to the radio for emergency information. And we know that there were 58,000 people two weeks after that shake that were still reliant on battery-powered radio for their main source of information. So digital disruption, power of radio in a crisis. Let's just explore that a little bit. So as an MOU, we have an MOU with Civil Defence which requires us to be ready and prepared to respond in any emergency. Uh, that applies across voluntary, across um, commercial radio stations as well. But to access that information, you still need an old school device. So in summary, very quickly, because I think a Q&A will be useful here, um, emergency communication is not one size fits all. It's horses for courses and choosing the right medium at the right time before, during, and after an emergency. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, John, and to everyone else. That was really thought-provoking and um, kind of got the sense that um, it's a bit like trying to board a moving train, or about 50 moving trains. Um, so the question with the most votes at this point is what proportion of people can or will actually engage with the newest, smartest technologies and how do we communicate to both the techno geeks and the techno phobes? Is there anyone who would like to put their hand up because um, everyone on this panel can add value to this one? <laughs> All right, I'll have, a, I'll have a first take at that and, and just join in. But I think there's, there's been quite a, a good broad range of, um, of discussion on that, so I'll probably it'd be a little bit of a summary um, in terms of, uh, from my perspective, I think we've moved, we need to change our mindsets. We've moved from scarcity to abundance in terms of reaching people. There's lots of channels. There's so many channels. Um, so it's... You know, as we saw with uh, Abby's conversation, reaching techno geeks—they're already actively there, and there are some—and um, they're organised. 
um, and it doesn't take too many, you know, you reach out to those, um, how many were, was it in Christchurch? 50, 50 people, and you're reaching a, a massive, you know, um, a massive network. Um, so my challenge, uh, you know, to sort of back on that is, I think it's about us making smart choices and, and mapping that out and going, well, if we have radio covered, which is our, in the, the first call, and, and we know that that's batter the battery operated radios are operational, if we've spoken to the techno geeks, if we've got one media company that you can feed a message to and it can go out to all the, all the, all the press, all the, you know, that, that feel, if we go to, those are three places you can go to. The challenge we've got as communicators at the moment is we're trying to go to a hundred places. You know, like we're trying to extend that out in, in, infinitesimally, and then we just—is that a word? Um, and and we're and we're we're becoming these uh, donkeys. You know, like we're—it's not that smart. We need to be looking at and agreeing with our uh, organisations what um, what we are going to hit and and do it. You know, if you map that out up, up front, you've agreed it with your organisation, and that is the. Um, the key 10 organizations or, or 10 touch points that you're going to kind of go to, then that will filter out um, into the organization. Does anybody want to kind of build on that one? I think my view is of all technology is that uh, once the, the novelty wears off, it'll live if it's useful. Um, and so... Um, most people in this room probably have a, an Air New Zealand app in their phone to help them book it because it's really useful and it's simple. And we keep forgetting that before these were kind of invented, when they were first explained, they sounded cumbersome and ex complicated and how would they work? And then sort of you turn around and there they are in your life. Um, so it's hard to predict which ones uh, are going to have an uptick beyond a tech geek community other than the ones that are painfully simple doing something probably very complicated for us. And so, yes, I am a, a minor disciple of the notion that asking something to do something, just like in real life, will be really powerful because it's what we already do. Lovely. Well, um, thank you for that. And that quite flows quite neatly into the next question, which is how do we move from controlling information flow to effectively connecting people with information given our regulated environment? Now, um, it's from Sue Ellen. Uh, what, sorry, where's Sue Ellen? What, um, what regulations did you have in mind in regards to potential barriers or, you know? So it's a little bit too prescriptive and narrow. Mm. Well. Is that one for you, Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, um, I'm probably not here to weigh in too much with my personal views, but I do think um, you know we are working on our own um, PIM guidelines and SOPs at McDem, and um, I don't think they should be overly prescriptive. I think we need to recognise we need to do work to recognise what the best channels are and what the channels are that suit your particular community. And um, I'm certainly not of the view that we should be putting regulations or rules in the way of that. Um, but we also need to recognise, um, like Tim was saying, this um, we've gone from scarcity to abundance. In a emergency situation, do we want to um, be trying to juggle 50 different channels at once, or do we just hone in on three or four that we know will be effective and let these community networks do the rest. Did you have anything just, you wanted to? Just to build on that, I mean, yeah. I, I agree. It, the, it, building a, a touch point map is, a comp is really hard and painful and um, takes a lot of time. 
It really does. And we're, we're quite used to it. We're, it's something quite uh, foreign from um, doing a, um, a vision and a statement and, and doing a little uh, plan of actions. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a few places now, we've become so kind of, um, we're so busy doing lots of things. We, now a plan can almost be like a budget line and it just has a little dollar next to it. And that's, what, that's a kind of plan. So I do, I, I, I do think that um, going that step, you know, like I think if we take Consu you know, consumers or you know, people at the front looking at the surface and, and that customer journey, it is painful, but it is worth its weight in gold when you come, you'll find that it'll engage people in the organization, it gives you focus. You can make tough calls now about, you know, because it is, it's what do we want to do and what are we not going to do and make a conscious decision about it. Um, because we, we're all, all working way too much, you know, like, and, and we're all doing too many hours on unnecessary, unnecessary stuff. It's, it comes down to, and I, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley community are big on MVP, you know, minimum viable product. What's the least you can do? That's what you, we need to switch our, how, in terms of doing, being seen to be doing lots, we need to switch our perspective and go, what's the least we can do to affect what we want to achieve. And I think that only by mapping can you kind of get to that. I, I would tweak it and say, in a, in, a consume, in, a, in a business sense, you go, what's the minimum lovable product? Uh, so I think you need to find that in terms of service. You know, what's the minimum lovable product? And if you go into a session with that in mind frame, it's different from going in and, go and trying to please everybody, you know, do everything. It's, it's a very different mindset. Can I say you, something quickly? I was just, ahead. oh, sorry. No, I'm, no, no. I'm being disruptive. Um, but I was looking at all of those mm. questions, and I have to, uh, yeah, all of them, and they all sort of had a common theme. And uh, there was, what about the people who are unconnected? And it was, what about the people who either have lost connectivity or maybe aren't engaged with those technologies? And I thought, yes, brilliant. And honestly, I think about half of those questions related to that in some way. And um, w what keeps me in check is always saying to myself, these new and emerging technologies both empower and disempower the community. And we've always got to remember that because um, you know, engaging with these new technologies is great, but who are we leaving behind? And do we have the old technologies in place that people have been using for generations? So for me, that, um, I think that's really good to hear that across the board. And um, I'm certainly not pushing for this full-blown, everything that's new and shiny, let's run for it, because that won't work. So um, you might want to. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to extend that a little bit, um, Abby, um, and a conversation that I know we had when we were talking about this, this session, uh, and that is the importance of relationship building before the shit hits the fan. Because if you've established your relationships either within your business, within your community, or with your local media, in my example, um, you have 50% of the of, of, of your problem covered. If you are trying to establish a relationship with your community or get your community to establish relationships with each other at the point when the problem occurs, you've got a big, big job ahead of you. Um, and I think something that really rings in my mind was, was something that I saw once that said, trust is the killer, is the killer app. Mm -hmm. So if you've got trust in your community or with your media or with, within your business, you are halfway there. So how would, how would small communities engage with um, Radio New Zealand National to have insight or spectrum documentaries made on their emergency preparedness strategies to share with others? Okay, so, so the answer to that one probably is we, we, it would be unlikely that we'd, we would do an insight or a spectrum on a particular small community, though if you looked at a program like Country Life, which goes out into, into quite small rural communities, quite possibly they would. What we did a couple of years ago was work with McDem and do a documentary that was called When the Siren Goes, um, which looked at um, emergency preparedness. That was done three or four years ago now, I think. Probably time for that to be um, reviewed and, and renewed, and that's maybe something that we could talk about as well. Yep. Great. Oh, 
all this is a juicy one. Are we ready for something like Viv? What happens post-disaster when technologies fail? Or what if they fail and create crises? Will traditional community level communication still work? So, Nick, I might get you to um, jump okay, in here. I'll have a go with that one. Okay. Um, can I preface this with uh, an admission? Um, I had a, a minor hidden agenda talking about social media. Uh, my hidden agenda was I don't think it should be used at the expense of any other, any other opportunities. What my hidden agenda was that related to was I believe there's a perception in government of most Western societies that social media is free um, and fails to recognise the huge amount of time and therefore the money spent on it. And I was politely trying to point out uh, to anybody who wanted to listen on the topic that actually it's also no longer free in terms of actually being in it because these are huge commercial entities making large amounts of money. Um, so, um, as Abby alluded to on other uh, points, that was a common theme about traditional media, digital media. Actually, I was trying to level the playing field in as much as they cost money. There it has to be time, whether it's people's time, or whether you're paying a media owner, or whether through your taxes you are paying Radio New Zealand. And I think that was something that I wanted to imply to everyone, that it needs to be valued. And as soon as money comes to the top of the equation, then people go, oh, hang on a minute, right. And so I feel that an awful lot of work that's done in social media by mm -hmm. all the volunteer groups, particularly, is massively undervalued, all right? So I think there's a good side to that. Um, as to Viv, um, yeah, well, this is a dichotomy, right? Um, right up until the shit hits the fan moment, we are all going to be texting, Facebooking our proverbials off, and we are not going to be able to help ourselves, all right? Um, and so, clearly, in the event of a, a disaster, um, we will turn to our radio, and without getting too political, uh, unless some of these things are not continue to be funded, that might not be there, because um, it is money that will keep these things going. Uh, however, whatever the funding model, mo model, 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 yes, how appropriate, model, there has to be something, and that's a trade-off. Um, I've seen technology that looks to use Wi-Fi to link people together when telcos go down. Um, so who knows? Some of this stuff might work. Um, what would be a shame is if lots of these things disappear because of commercial imperatives and then they aren't there. Um, I can't answer that other than to empathise with possibly being that person in that situation wondering, where's it gone? Where's my help? And I guess the last thing I'd like to say is I think that's why pre-event, it's so important to try and develop a really coherent identity message from you all, whoever you all ends up being, so that I know it's the truth, it's the best information, however I get it. Um, I just want to say one thing about a very good question, mm. what happens post-disaster when technologies fail? Um, in my research I looked at lots of different case studies and what I found so amazing is some technologies failed but everybody just morphed to the technology that was up and running and so for example with the Christchurch recovery map there were obviously some communities that didn't have the internet they didn't have the power to charge everything they started printing these maps on a daily basis and handing them out to community groups. In Japan, um, a lot of different technologies were overloaded, so everybody morphed to Twitter. And so what we're seeing is that with all these multiple channels, um, yes, some go down, but everybody just goes to what's working. And I think that's something we need to think about from capability to just thinking about the capabilities we have to deal with this very adaptive society when it comes to communication channels. So. Right, thank you. Oh, this is a, a curly one. Do we need to centralise emergency <laughs> communication? And if so, how do we do it? I'm anonymous. Um, and it's worth probably me pointing out, we do centralise emergency communication up to a point, um, but the vast, vast majority of emergency communications is carried out, you know, um, in the regions by the CDM groups, and I think there's a really good reason for that because 
they're your communities, they're your channels. Um, but um, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear the uh, panel's views on this. Is there a, is there a place for greater centralisation? Is or should it be more devolved to, say, the regions and the agencies responsible? All right, who's going to walk into this uh, <laughs> this one first? I think, um, I'm sure you have a view about how you organise it. My own personal view from a comms point of view is it's less about centralisation or decentralisation, it's about coherence. So I need, I need, I had a, a corny little slide that was trying to suggest the, you know, two plus two is five, uh, as in w collectively what what is done needs to add up to a greater coherence, not confusion. And that's ultimately a communication challenge, what you say, who it's from, not what channels, what region. And I see, um, I'm quite passionate about the civil defence, I've helped on shake out, I see a, a huge amount of work, and at the risk of being asked to leave the room, I wish you would harness all of that more. So I see a Facebook post for, from one region, think that's fantastic, and that's it. Why uh, that should be shared and leveraged and promoted elsewhere. Um, I think, and that's what I mean by coherence as opposed to whether it's from Wellington or whether it's from Auckland. I, I should I leave? No, no. <laughs> I was just going to build on that and just talk about um, there's some models for social media in terms of evolution of social media and what tends to happen or the flow seems to be. Uh, you start off with a kind of random, then everybody goes, oh shit, we, we're, it's, it's, we're all over the place here, and we centralise, and you pull it together, and then you go to this spoke kind of, uh, you know, maybe where we are now in terms of hub and spoke, um, w uh, you know, uh, and then the greater state is, is sort of where Nick's alluding to in terms of more of a honeycomb kind of where everybody, uh, it's, a, it's an interrelated environment and everybody's working together. Um, so that would be the kind of social media model that you kind of go through. So I would argue, can you centralise communication? I, I would argue in the modern era that you can't control. And so, you know, you need to evolve your model along and, and, um, and have that connected message so that people see, know where to go for, the, for, um, for messaging. But, the, 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 but wherever you touch, you co you've got a great message and a, a connected message. Did anyone else want to chip in on that? I, I don't have the answer to this, this question, but I think we've got a, a huge amount of experts in the room, so if anybody wants to say something on this mm. question, I'd love to hear from, from yeah. you guys. Well, how, how successful do we think Amos is working? <laughs> this morning, um, what, what counts for the first people to use it? We've had this guy for some years, and as a national icon utility, we still haven't been trained. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, sorry, yep. I think one of the risks is if we do centralise it, we're going to slow down basically. Mm. So, you know, we're talking yesterday and today about the whole decentralised model we've got and the network environment that we've got. And is it more than a matter of ensuring that we have a range of uh, nodes on our network that we can trust to put that together for us, that people see an authoritative resource, and we we'll let people scratch mm. with it. Whether Now we've got two or three minutes left, so um, we'll um, wind up shortly.
we as responding organizations communicate, we, we can reasonably rely on the fact that the publicly available networks either will not exist or will be vitally unstable. Right. That's a great point. And um, one thing that Nick said that really resonated with me that kind of brings a lot of this together is about coherence because we've got this plethora of channels and with that comes opportunities and dilemmas and I think if we can communicate to the public in a, um, sorry, if we can communicate to the public in a coherent way then irrespective of the channels that we use, um, that's really the critical thing. Now um, we're bang on, we've got one minute to go so I'll wind things up now. Thank you so much to all of you for coming and I'd really like to thank the panel for a really thought-provoking and valuable, thought-provoking valuable insights. Thank you so much. Thank you.